I graduated from college in 1969. I was at a Southern all women's college, a very good school, but pretty conservative. And my father at that time was stationed at the Pentagon. He was deputy secretary of the joint chiefs in the Navy. And my fiance, man, I did marry, uh, was fighting in Vietnam, Marine Lieutenant. He was in Vietnam fighting. So this was very difficult. Um, because I was slowly coming around to thinking this was a disaster and seeing my friends die there and worrying about my husband. And you couldn't pick up a phone then. It was two weeks of mail. And by the time you got the letter, you weren't sure if he was still alive. So it was very difficult. I started getting interested in journalism. I mean, really got bitten by the, by the bug when I was on uh, maternity leave from a high school teaching job right out of college, I was teaching English and theater. And I was home to have two babies in a row going out of my mind. And I started thinking about writing for the local weekly paper. And I loved it. I loved writing about things that were going on. We got a sheriff indicted. I mean, it was really a powerful little group of journalists um, I think the paper was free. I think people used it to line their canary cages, but it didn't matter. I loved the work. So when it came time to go back to teaching, I said, no, I'm going to use my theater training and learn radio and be a radio journalist. I just thought this is the way to go for me. And so I even got my my engineer's license, the one you have to you know, study for and take a test so that you could turn on all the things at a radio station because I knew it was a one-man band if I was going anywhere. And sure enough, a local station was looking for somebody for their morning news. And I told them I could do all the operations and I had my license. And they said, oh, you sound perfect. Um, on the day before I was to report, they called and said, you know, our owner thinks that a woman with children is not going to be reliable. What if they get sick, you won't show up? It was unbelievable. <laughs> it was When I look back on it, I think that's just classic, which is probably a godsend because I had to look for a, another job and I ended up getting a good news job at an all news station in Princeton where um, I was the only woman on the air. They needed a woman. I walked in the door, they said, how about you? And from the get-go, I was told over and over again that they love my voice because I sounded like a guy. And when I teach women, journalists, young journalists, I tell them about this and they can't believe it because women can sound like women now. It's wonderful. But that was not so. It was, and I still sound, I have a deep register. Eventually, I went to CBS Radio News in New York. I was picked up by them, which was wonderful, network job. And they wanted me on in the mornings. Jackie Judd came right after me from NPR and she wanted to be on morning drive as well, which is where you wanna be if you're in radio. And they said, oh, we already have one there, which was me. We already have one of them, right? Uh, so I was on in the very early morning hours, single mom, I had a live-in help riding in from New Jersey every morning at 4 a.m. to be on the air by six. It was hard, but I was young. And one day, Mike Wallace strode into the newsroom. He was at 60 Minutes, and we all shared kind of one newsroom then, TV and radio. And he walked in and he said, you, you're the woman with balls in her voice. And that was supposed to be a compliment, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, you sound just like a guy is what he was saying. So that was sort of the the hurdles. And then there was the humor, uh, the jokes, um, the things that people would not tolerate today or would never say today in a newsroom. Uh, even when I was at ABC television, when I got that job, and went over to the TV side, they sent me to L.A. We had a bureau chief who he was just uh, really really out of it in terms of PC uh, behavior. And one day I had written an essay for the website 
they had me do commentary now and then. And he said, you know, Judy, and he said this in front of the whole newsroom, this just sounds like the rantings of a middle-aged menopausal woman. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I, I've learned how to handle these idiots. So I pulled out a notebook and I said, just, just repeat that. Let's see, April 4th, 1990, that sounds like a menopausal old white woman. Okay, anything else? And he was, he had turned red as a beat. He thought he was being funny. And the whole place got quiet. And he goes, oh, you know, I was just kidding. I went, okay, 10.55, just kidding. Thank you. And I walked away. Never happened again. Today, he'd be reported. He wouldn't say it in the first place. I think we've made some strides. What's also wonderful is that today there's so much room and so many outlets. It isn't just networks. It's all over the place. You can get work in a lot of different ways, um, doing what you love to do. So I think it's it's so much improved. Well, I'm proud to say I don't have many I'm embarrassed by. <laughs> so uh, I would admit it if I did, but I um, can't think of any offhand if it pops up into my head, I'll tell you. Um, things I'm proud of, um, and this is on my mind because I've been asked to lecture about it at USC, a class that's looking at civil rights through the lens of some of the cases that happened in LA over the years. I covered both the Rodney King beating, both trials, the uprising riots that followed the not guilty verdict of the cops who beat up Rodney King. Um, I mean, it was an amazing time to be there, and I'd only been in, a, in L.A. at ABC for a couple of years when this happened. Um, and consequently, I, I covered the O.J. Simpson case, both trials, and I could see the through line. Uh, there was a big, bigger story here than just the sensationalist aspects, especially of, of O.J., um, and I did a piece for Peter Jennings. We put it on a special report just before the verdict in the OJ case, the criminal case, looking at how this case had pulled the curtain back on the disparity between the ways whites and blacks see the justice system in America, which now sounds so, oh yeah, duh. But then it was revelatory. And we did a, I think I did a five minute piece on this interviewing black citizens of LA and white citizens of LA and the disparity, we did it with polling and looked at the disparity of people who thought he was guilty and not guilty, all down racial lines. I interviewed the uh, editor of the Sentinel newspaper, which is a black newspaper, and he and I, and we decided to leave this in the piece because it, even though it was kind of embarrassing to me is like, look at the white woman interview this guy, he said, I can't see this jury convicting him under these circumstances right now. Circumstances being? No evidence. Amazing. But accurate. Wow. And we both recognized what was happening at that moment. I thought there was a ton of evidence. And he thought, ah, oh, cops planted the evidence. It was wild. And we thought it was a very important story to tell. And I had covered it for uh, Nightline mostly um, and was given a lot of time. And we really looked at that angle the whole time because Ted Koppel got a lot of criticism for covering OJ as, you know, it's a sensationalism. Why are you doing this on Nightline? Of course, all the people who said that watched. Um, and he said, this is a bigger story than black athlete, famous guy uh, accused of killing white wife, which is how it was always framed. This is a much bigger story, and we're getting at that. And, and I'm proud of that work. I loved doing stories in the West, um, and, and Peter Jennings really encouraged me to do those. Conservation stories, um, water issues, which is never easy to tell. Water issue I've covered forever and did a, a piece on the Colorado River, or Lake Powell, um, and way back when, um, and it was a whole half hour on Nightline, and it holds up today because of what's happening. 
We are now fighting over the water. The Navajo are finally getting uh, acknowledged that they have a share in it, just as the Colorado River is going away. I wrote a book, Emus Loose in Egnar, Big Stories from Small Towns, is about weekly newspapers. Small newspaper editors love it because nobody was had really paid attention to them and what it's like to report on people you live next door to. As I talk about all this, I realize I'm busy. The men were used to calling all the shots. Um, I don't think that they saw women as equals in the newsroom. I think they saw us as tokens to begin with. Although I have to say, CBS News Radio, I really was treated with great respect. Dallas Townsend, Richard C. Hodlett, Doug Edwards. These people were there when I came in. This is how old I am. And these were Murrow's boys. I mean, this was extraordinary to be next to people who'd done this kind of reporting, war reporting and whatnot. Doug Edwards is the first television anchor in this country before um, Walter Cronkite. So he was sitting next to me, you know, and we're typing away on typewriters before the computers came in. And, and I remember having that, uh, that feeling of what is that imposter syndrome? You know, somebody's going to come in here and get the hook and get me out of here. But they all were so helpful. And I have to say that Charlie Osgood, who just passed, was um, he, I had been on the overnight shift, which was hell, for a year. They do that to everybody. And then they brought me on to the morning shift, which was great. But he said, I really like your writing and I'd like you to fill in for me for the Osgood file when I go on vacation. And he went on vacation a lot. So my life really expanded because of that. So he was both a mentor and then he became a competitor, which might be, in fact, a greater compliment now that I look at it. Yeah. I was never, I'd have to say, sexually harassed in a sexual way. I was perhaps dismissed uh, and and considered less than because I was a woman. I think you had to stand up and fight for assignments. Deb Amos would know more about this. Um, Christian Amanpour, people like that who really had to go out there and be tough to be getting foreign assignments and war correspondent assignments. I didn't really want that. Uh, when I first came to ABC, Peter called and said, would you like to go to Iraq? It'd be a six week thing. I'm a single mom. I've just moved my kids to a new place. And my mind was spinning. And all I thought was, I, I, don't, I can't, I can't risk my life for Disney. I don't want to die for Disney. That's, you know, I didn't say it that way. I'm not cut out of that mold. It's, it's just the whole judgmental, condescending, atmosphere, uh, no matter how good you are. Um, but that was the 90s. And we've come a long way. We have. Um, there's a woman running ABC News now. In, in Princeton, which is my first radio job, I was the only woman on the air. Okay. And it's because they were under pressure to get one. one. Then we went to Denver, and I worked in an all-news station, um, where it was quite sexist. I was the only woman on the air. There were disc jockeys and I did stories. I won awards for investigative pieces. They allowed me to do all of that. But the two disc jockeys in the morning would toss to me saying, let's go now to Newsette. That was their toss. Yeah. The secretary in the main office calls me and says, are you aware that he's being paid almost twice what you are. And she shouldn't have told me, but she did. She was really outraged. And I went to the news director of the station and I said, I understand that you're paying Lance Lamott uh, twice as much money as I'm being paid. Why is that? And he looked at me and he said, well, Judy, you're married to a guy who makes a lot of money. He said, what does that have to do with anything? Will you repeat that tomorrow when I come back with a lawyer? I actually said this. I couldn't believe I had the guts to say it. 
And they said, oh, oh, now I would, you know, come on. No, let's just take a look at this. And they brought my salary up to meet his. And, and that was the first time I'd ever, I would not have known if she, if this woman in the front office hadn't told me she was so upset. So there's been a, there's a lot of that. Women supporting women, whether you're black, a woman, uh, Native American. I mean, you know, we were just tokens in the newsroom if we were there at all. And um, you really had to be very good. And, I, and I'm saying that without any shyness. I was very good at what I did. I'm a good writer. And they had to keep me. The economic model and security issues in journalism today, which are terrible. You know, look what happened at the LA Times just recently. A third of the staff got laid off and half of them were veterans. Nobody's paying. And I think until we can educate people in a news literacy sense, and this is one of my big passions as well, I introduced a news literacy course at USC, teaching people not only critical thinking skills about what information they're getting, but how incumbent it is upon them to support the journalism outlets that they appreciate and trust. And people aren't doing that. They just see stuff on Facebook and somebody's you know, taken an article and posted it and nobody's paying for that. It's really rather scary. I am now on the board of CoLab, which is the Colorado Media Lab. And we are uh, a collaboration of, of news outlets around the state of Colorado many of them weekly newspapers, which are just hanging on. And as you know, thousands of weeklies have gone under in the last few years, creating what we call news deserts, which is a place where dirty politicians and crooks flourish. And people have no idea what's going on except on Facebook, which is gossip. And we are really intent on helping these places develop business models that can be sustained. We help them with the reporting, we provide uh, legal help if they run into problems. That we teach them how to do FOIA requests. It's it's still I'm still in the game, but in a different kind of way. Post COVID, I think we have a problem with students. Maybe even young journalists. They're reticent to ask hard questions. They haven't been out there uh, face to face much. They do a lot of Zoom interviews, um, which is all the networks are doing that too. And that takes away a lot from your ability to grow as a, as a reporter, not to be in the room. And I'm, I'm sad about that, but I hope, I hope that it'll come back face to face, shoe leather. They were very proud. I mean, just glowing. My dad was very, very proud. And, uh, and we grew up in an interesting time. I mean, my father um, was the deputy secretary of the Joint Chiefs at the Pentagon when Vietnam was being prosecuted. And he sent the first ships into the Tonkin Gulf. And I was protesting around the Pentagon. I was in college. And my brother was part of the Berkeley Day Committee out in Oakland, in Berkeley, protesting the war. So our dinner conversations were quite extraordinary. Um, my father was more worried about me being arrested as I protested. But I was writing editorials for my college paper against the war. And this is Mary Washington College in Fredericksburg, Virginia, which was quite conservative. And uh, after I wrote one editorial, they suggested I leave campus that weekend because people were really upset. <laughs> I said, you think they're upset? You should ask my family. Anyway, um, but later... Um, many years later, my father said, you know, I just have to say this. You and your brother were right. And it was after McNamara came out with all the things that he had hidden, knew. We had friends who died that year after they knew they were losing, but kept up appearances. So he was really upset about that and came to me and said, we were wrong and you were right. So that took a lot for a career naval officer to say. Um, he was a very even-handed, rational person. Um, and they were very proud.
I meet a lot of journalists who are former military brats. They feel restless, you know, and it's an, and inquisitive about another country and a place to go and what's next um, and have no trouble with shifting in the middle of things. What we have trouble doing is maintaining long relationships. We have to work at that because you know when you meet a friend, you're going to be saying goodbye in two years. If your mother says she loves you, check it out. <laughs> that old saw from newsrooms around the country. Um, you know, trust but verify. I, it's verify, verify, verify. Do not rush to be first. Slow down to be right. Um, and keep in mind the feelings of the person you're reporting on and interviewing. Um, have some empathy. Um, you have to tell the truth, but the truth is multi-layered and try to be the person you'd want interviewing you. And I often would feel that way when I had to go do a difficult interview, especially after Columbine, which was the day I almost quit after that week. I just didn't think I could do it. One more interview of a parent who's lost a kid or a teacher. I'd been a high school teacher. I was a mother. It was, but I brought that, right? You bring your experience to the situation. And uh, I just thought this is, here's what I would say. Who would I want knocking on my door? I'd want me. So I think that that's what I teach them. So it, it, it's been a real different kind of path, um, but all driven by the fact that I love this work. I never thought about doing anything else. After I worked for that little paper, and I, maybe that's why I love little papers. I mean, the work we did made a difference. It got somebody indicted. Now, look at how delicious that sounds. We got somebody indicted. <laughs> <laughs> but he deserved to be. But it's it was such a hook and such a passion, and it's never never left me. And it's such a wonderful job. It's such a wonderful job because you get the fullness of life. We don't have anything in the first segment. You're kidding me. No, I'm not kidding you. Hello, ENR. Get a tape rolling right now. In the break, one ten. Everything. Did you get that thing? Did you get that thing?